Tonight, the fight for religious freedom. A look back at my one-on-one -on -one conversation with Vice President Mike Pence from the campus of Ave Maria University in Florida. Plus, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders talks about the administration's duty to protect life. And Our Lady of Fatima, inside one of the most popular tourist sites in the world for the faithful. On a special edition of EWTN News Nightly for Monday, May 27th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining me from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Earlier this year, I traveled with Vice President Mike Pence to Ave Maria University. We had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And while there, the Vice President renewed the Trump administration's commitment to religious freedom. Mr. Vice President, thank you for joining us. You bet, Lauren. Good to see you. You just gave a speech about religious freedom, health care, a variety of topics important to the administration. Yet freedom of religion is very important to you. The last time we talked, your wife was under attack for going to teach art at a Christian school. How else has this affected your life? Well, it's, um, it hasn't affected our life much at all. As I said to you before, we're, we're used to criticism. But to be able to stand here at Ave Maria University, to be able to see all these bright, shiny young faces, I just wanted them to know that while it's become fashionable in recent days for media elites and Hollywood liberals to be critical of people with religious faith, that we stand with them. And that the American people stand in solidarity for the freedom of religious expression of, of every American. And we cherish Christian education. This is a remarkable university to think of this place in just 10 short years and the impact that they're having, not just in laying a foundation of education for these children, but Lauren to learn of how these young people are, are serving in their community, literally serving around the world. Uh, it's, it's been truly inspiring to be here. And not just in America are you fighting for religious freedom. You mentioned recently that Secretary Mike Pompeo uh, said, and he and Ambassador Brownback have continued to call out China as the worst violators of human rights in the world. It's cracking down on ethnic minorities, Catholics, the Uyghur Muslims. And I'm, I'm wondering, will we see conditions on human indignities included in trade talks? Well, let me, let me just say that it is, um, it's with a heavy heart that we reflect that more than 80% than of the world's population live in societies where there is uh, religious repression or restriction on religious liberty. And the United States and this administration have stood strong, whether it be in this hemisphere, uh, in, in uh, Nicaragua, where we've literally seen gangs attack Catholic churches and Catholic priests, whether we see the brutality of ISIS that our armed forces and our allies have recently uh, taken back every inch of territory the ISIS caliphate had once controlled, or whether it's in the world's most populous nation of China. The United States will always call out uh, nations around the world to recognize and to respect the religious beliefs of their citizens. And with regard to China, we're engaged in discussions about resetting our trading relationship. And not just the imbalance, Lauren, but our negotiations are focused on structural issues like uh, the theft of intellectual property, of forced technology transfers, all the things that have impacted our trading relationship and created such uh, an imbalance for American workers and American businesses. We're hopeful that those discussions will go forward and be productive with China. They're going on literally as we speak. But rest assured, as our relationship with China continues to change and to grow, we're, we're going to speak out and we're going to stand up for the rights of religious minorities in China and everywhere around the world. You spoke about abortion in your speech today. On Tuesday, Secretary Mike Pompeo announced the expansion of the Mexico City policy, and yesterday he was on Capitol Hill uh, talking about that expansion when Representative Lois Frankel, a Democrat from right here in Florida, called the Trump administration abortion-obsessed. What's your response to that? 
This is an administration that's deeply committed to the sanctity of human life and to upholding those policies in, um, in not only our, our domestic policies, and, but also in foreign policy and in foreign aid. And what the Secretary of State announced this week at the President's direction was that the Mexico City policy, which prevents any taxpayer dollars from going to organizations that, that promote uh, abortion around the world, we're now making sure that organizations can't transfer those dollars to organizations that utilize abortion as a means of birth control. This is, this is keeping faith with uh, a policy that Ronald Reagan established, and I couldn't be more proud to serve alongside uh, the most pro-life president in American history, whether it be reinstituting the Mexico City policy in the early days of this administration, uh, whether it be standing for conscience protections of, of institutions like Ave Maria University. This administration, President Donald Trump and I, will always stand for life. The Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act would outlaw and penalize infanticide. We have seen in New York you can now have an abortion there right up until the moment of birth. Pro-lifers are so disheartened by this. States are pushing back, but what is the administration going to do to counter those kind of state laws? Well, first let me just say that uh, the fact that you see states like uh, Virginia and New York taking up legislation that allows for late-term abortion, when you see the, the governor of Virginia uh, actually uh, support infanticide and then to see Democrats in the Senate vote against a bill that protects children that are born alive uh, it, it just suggests to you I, I think the desperation uh, of the left in this country the truth is and I saw it in the faces of these children at this school today more and more Americans are embracing the sanctity of life life is winning in America and particularly among younger Americans who are recognizing the sanctity of life. And with President Trump's appointment of, of strict constructionists to our federal courts at every level, um, I, I, we sense that the left is now reaching. They're bringing that abortion on demand agenda to the state levels, and, and they're really revealing that they are, they're the party of abortion on demand and even the party of infanticide. And our party under President Trump will always stand for the sanctity of life, and we'll stand, we'll stand with the unborn. Under the Affordable Care Act, abortion was made a lot more readily available to people. Now President Trump says the GOP is going to be the party of health care. So are there elements of the Affordable Care Act that you would preserve, like pre-existing conditions or health coverage of adult children? Lauren, there are, there are elements of Obamacare like protecting pre-existing condition, um, allowing adult children to remain on their parents' health insurance that the Republicans have long supported and the President and I strongly support. But look, Obamacare has failed. We all remember the broken promises of Obamacare. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. If you like your insurance, you can keep it. Um, they said that health insurance premiums would go down. Uh, they've actually gone up dramatically, more than 100% in some places around the country. What President Trump announced this week is that we are going to be the party of health care. While the Democrats have made it clear where they're headed, it's even more government takeover of health care. Their Medicare for All proposal is nothing short of socialized medicine, single-payer health care that would take the most precious decisions in our lives and the lives of our families and put them in the hands of bureaucrats with scarce federal resources. President Trump and I believe that the time has come for us to reject socialized medicine, reject their government takeover of health care, and we're working with members of Congress as we speak to lay out a plan for health care reform that's built on the doctor-patient relationship that's, and that's built on, on the principles of freedom that, that have already created the greatest health care system the world has ever known. When will we see the plan? Well, working on it as we speak with members of Congress. Even this week we've begun discussions, and I know those are underway in the House and in the Senate. But look, the American people have a choice to make uh, in this coming election. Uh, our administration has already supported reforms like association health plans that have created more uh, health insurance choices for Americans and for small businesses. Democrats want Medicare for all. They want government-run 
health care along the, the socialist model of Canada and other European countries, we're going to be presenting uh, to the American people in the course of this election a health care plan that's built on freedom that will lower the cost of health insurance without growing the size of government. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President, for joining us at the Mother Teresa Museum mm -hmm. here. I know you quote her often. Thank you. I do. Such an inspiration, and it's great to see you here, Lauren. Coming up, the White House press secretary and the president's commitment to life. And the shrine to Our Lady of Fatima. On May 3rd, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders talked to me one-on-one -on -one for a wide-ranging conversation. We talked about the administration's commitment to protecting life, the president's legacy in reshaping the judicial landscape, and the new rule aimed at protecting the conscience rights of those in the medical profession. Joining me now from the White House is Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. Sarah, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you, and uh, happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday. Yesterday, during the National Day of Prayer ceremony in the Rose Garden, President Trump announced a new rule allowing health care workers to refuse to participate in abortions on religious grounds. So my question to you is, how can people navigate these tricky waters without being accused of discrimination? Uh, look, I think there, there is some difficulty there, but the bottom line is the president wants to do everything he can and everything that his administration has the power to do to protect life. Uh, it's one of the fundamentals of our society. It's probably one of the most important uh, parts of who America is, is that we value life. It sets us apart from the people that don't and the countries that don't. Uh, and it is, I think, one of the most sacred duties that the president has. And this is something the president takes extremely seriously. And it's why you've seen him take so many big steps and bold moves in order to do that uh, since he's become president in his administration. Conscience protections are a part of a sweeping effort by the administration to preserve religious liberty. Earlier this week, the Tennessee House rejected a bill to give faith-based adoption agencies the liberty to choose whether or not to allow LGBTQ adults to adopt children. So what is the president's message for these faith-based adoption agencies? I think it's this, the same thing uh, that he say, said yesterday, and that it's we have to protect religious liberty, whether it comes to adoption or whether it's uh, about the places of worship. We have to protect religious liberty and religious freedom in this country. Uh, it's part of who we are, and it's something that not only do we not want to get away from, but we shouldn't get away from. And it's something we have to embrace, and it's something the president is committed to and will continue to fight for uh, in every facet that he can. And this is just another step uh, furthering his fight for religious liberty. It's been heartbreaking, I know, for me and for our audience, and probably for you to watch these recent attacks on churches, synagogues, mosques here and around the world. The vice president today is heading to Louisiana, where black churches were burned by an arsonist. You, I have learned, read this devotional every single day called Take My Heart, O God, written by women. And in it today, it says that our faith does not have walls. Christ's followers cannot be silenced. So what does it say to you that more and more of our sacred spaces are in need of protection? Uh, it's truly, I think, a, a sad moment, not just for our country, but for the world. Uh, that people don't feel safe in the places that they go to worship. We've seen a number of attacks on places of worship over the last year, um, and it's something that's certainly extremely troubling. But I think it's another reason that we have to embrace our faith even more, uh, because the only way to find comfort in those difficult moments and in horrific tragedy is in the hands of the Creator. And I think that is uh, something that strengthens our faith rather than cheapens it. It's something that drives us closer to God instead of further away. And I think the more that we do that, the better off we'll be as a country and as uh, a global community. And I think um, that the steps that we're seeing both the president take and the vice president take about calling out uh, these horrific acts and calling them by name and 
condemning evil, condemning bigotry, condemning hate is something that we have to do and something that we'll continue to do in this administration. I'd like to move on to some other headlines. The big economic headline today is that unemployment is 3.6 percent, almost a 50-year low. 263,000 new jobs were created in April. So why are we not seeing more reporting on economic news like this in the mainstream media? That's a great question. I'd love for us to talk about the economy all day long. It's one of the most important issues that faces our country, and it's one of the reasons that the president's made it such a priority since becoming president. He's put a tremendous amount of focus on creating a friendly uh, job creation environment, on creating real growth, real wage increases, uh, by getting rid of regulations through tax cuts. The economy is booming, and you can't deny it. We have seen month after month uh, of continued growth in our economy, and that's due directly to the leadership of this president and the policies that he has put in place. Uh, this is another huge month uh, for the economy and another great sign as we move uh, into this next quarter of the year. There's a lot of partisanship here in Washington, maybe you've noticed. <laughs> president <laughs> to Trump say the least. <laughs> opened the National Day of Prayer event yesterday at the White House with prayers for the people of Venezuela and said that the U.S. is there to help. So many have been killed. The economy there is in a free fall. Yet yesterday, Representative Omar, a Democrat from Minnesota, doubled down, blaming the U.S. for this crisis. Tell us what your reaction is to that. It's unbelievable to think that uh, this crisis is at the hands of the United States. We're trying to help uh, the people of Venezuela. We've stated time and again that we stand with those people. We have uh, worked to get aid, uh, food and water and medicine to the people of Venezuela and help to try to create a, a place for a peaceful transition of power. Uh, unfortunately, we aren't seeing that take place. Maduro is digging in, uh, but we still want to make sure and keep our focus on the people of Venezuela and making sure that they're getting uh, the life-saving things that they need, whether it's food, water, or medical supplies. President Trump said yesterday in an interview that there is a tipping point, however, for sending in troops. What is that tipping point? Uh, look, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the strategy, but I can tell you the president and his team are keeping all options on the table. Ideally, we don't get to a place where uh, military action is required, but as both the president and the secretary of state and Ambassador Bolton have all stated, the president will do what is required uh, and help to fight for the people of Venezuela and to protect the people of Venezuela as they go through this difficult time. I want to move on to uh, an interesting poll that shows that 69 percent of white evangelical Protestants and 44 percent of white Catholics give the president high marks for doing the job that he's doing as president. And I would just want to say that that 44 percent number could be a lot higher if he came on to News <laughs> Nightly. But I want to know we'll how important, <laughs> got to get the pitch in, how important will the support of the religious community be heading toward 2020? Uh, it's in, incredibly important because they make up such a large part of the country. Uh, and the president's done a lot for this community, uh, not just on the things that we've talked about, but also, and I think one of the biggest legacies that the president will leave behind long after he has left office is the remaking of the judiciary. The president yesterday had his 100th federal judge confirmed uh, to their seat, and this is going to have a generational impact and a very positive one that we are seeing, and particularly at a time uh, when state legislatures, as well as uh, the, the government here in D.C., constantly overreaching and overstepping. You need that last line of defense to hold, uh, uphold the Constitution and the rule of law, and we're going to see that uh, take place in the judicial branch on a number of fronts, uh, I would imagine, over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And having uh, these people that understand and believe and support the Constitution is going to be a real important part of the president's legacy. And I think it's going to be one of the most important uh, things that he does uh, during his time of eight years in office. Before we go, um, I interviewed the American Enterprise president and author Arthur Brooks about his new book called Love Your Enemies. He says that we have to do it by disagreeing better. No contempt, no insults. Do you think that doing that in this political climate will ever be possible? And, and how does the president uh, respond to something like that? I know he said in the past that, you know, he's got to punch back. 
Uh, certainly, I think we can, uh, there are many times where we can disagree better. The president was elected to be a fighter, though, and uh, people expect that when he gets hit, he will hit back. There's a difference between disagreeing better and fighting differently. Uh, certainly, I think we can focus our disagreements more on the policy differences that we have instead of the personal attacks. I think what we've seen over the last two years of Democrats and the mainstream media perpetuating a lie and attacking the president and everyone around him day in and day out. Let's not forget the severity of the accusation that they made against the president. They actually called him a traitor to his country. I mean, let that sink in. The sitting president of the United States of America, they called him a traitor to his country and expect him to just sit down and not respond to that and not fight back. Um, that's not disagreeing. That's defending. That's making sure the American people know the truth. On a policy perspective, I think certainly we can focus on the contrast that we have on the issues. But when it comes to uh, making sure that people understand what really happened, I think it's important for the president uh, to push back and to be bold and aggressive in that pushback. Finally, our um, our photographer, uh, one of our photographers came and brought his daughter to uh, take your child to work day and was <laughs> lucky enough to get a question with you, but you filibustered. He said, oh, no. the, the, the question was, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? And you said, well, I don't have one, it's two scoops. So as a hard hitting journalist here, I'm going back in for the kill. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought he was asking me about the president's favorite kind of ice cream, oh. which is why I was a little less oh. uh, quick to answer. If, if it's mine, I guess I'd have to say probably mint chocolate chip. Okay, there we but go. I, I'm trying to avoid uh, that, me, uh, that at all costs these days. Me too, me too. It's, it's, uh, it's a constant battle, shall we say. Sarah <laughs> Sanders, White House Press Secretary, thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Thanks for having me on. Up next, we'll show you the shrine dedicated to Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal. Finally tonight, 102 years ago, three shepherd children reported apparitions of the Virgin Mary in the little town in central Portugal called Fatima. Now the site is one of the most popular and well-known Marian shrines in the world. Pilgrims from all over the world visit Fatima every year, and many make their way to the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary on their knees. Between May and October of 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared here to three shepherd children. A statue marks the spot where the apparitions took place. Our Lady told Lucia on the left and her cousins Francisco and Jacinta on the right to pray the rosary every day for world peace, repent, and make sacrifices to convert sinners. In 2017, on the 100th anniversary of the first apparition, Pope Francis canonized Francisco and Jacinta. Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston was present. Such a short life, they achieved uh, great sanctity and holiness, and the fact that the Blessed Mother chose them is very significant. So I think there's a great lesson in this and uh, all the saints' lives are sermons for us, but in, in these children it's a reminder that how precious children are. Francisco and Jacinta both died before age 12. Lucia, the third visionary who later became a nun, passed away in 2005 at the age of 97. Her cause for canonization is open and the Vatican is investigating her life. According to the shrine in 2017, on the occasion of the centenary, more than nine million pilgrims took part in celebrations. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and at Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you. Thank you.